So, am I good to go? Yes, sir. Well, if I'm good to go, it'll be the first time in my life. <laughs> uh, pleasure to be with you, college students, uh, this wintry, blasted morning. Uh, I, I brought all my sweaters and leather jacket and uh, scarf and mittens, and then I got too warm. And, but I am enjoying being with you folks. Um, I taught uh, college and graduate school for 30 years in two different institutions. And uh, part of that time was teaching a course in Baptist polity. And so this is a course that is near and dear to my heart. I wasn't raised in a Baptist church and I came to Baptist ideals through a process of what you are doing, reading books, studying, and then thinking about it. And over a period of time, I became a Baptist by conviction, as it's a cliche, but it is certainly me, regardless of where I go and minister. And sometimes my ministry takes me to wide fields abroad. I do a lot of international work for ACE, but when you scratch me, I bleed Baptist. And uh, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is not a denomination. It is what you're going to uh, hear this morning in this essay. Now, <laughs> listen, uh, I uh, feel bad for you because what you have in front of you is very long and very um, tedious, uh, but I don't know of any other way, since I'm only here this just once, but to see if I can't blow through it. Now, last night, uh, just to see if uh, how I could do that, I went through it and I, uh, for three hours, I rewrote it in summary fashion in 11 pages. Now that's, that's how Del Johnson learns. I redo things and put them in, uh, put things succinctly in, in, in simple sentences. But um, this is huh, how to introduce this. Um, wouldn't we all probably agree that America in 2016 is a mess, and it is getting messier by the day, by the week, by the month, by the year. And as you can see, I wrote this essay back in 1982. Oh my word. Uh, when I go back and reflect on what I wrote, I just say, uh, Lord, help us. Um, as to what is happening to this great country of ours, that we are losing. And so now, so then I say, there are things in here, things, ideas in here, that if they grip your mind and your heart and your soul, it will change you and you can help change those around you. And that is how change can happen in America. But apart from that, I don't know that there is any hope. Um, when we lose a sense of our past, we don't know who we are in the present, and we have no idea where we are heading. Uh, the past is prologue, someone said. But uh, in modern times, no one wants to study the past. Uh, People don't care for history. The great universities are land, like Harvard and Yale. I say great in parenthesis. Don't even teach a history of Western civilization anymore. And so the ideals that are the founding, the foundation of our civilization are not being taught. And so where do we begin? Well, we begin with ourselves. And so uh, 
let's uh, begin with my essay. Careful historians recognize that Baptist tenacity to freedom of conscience contributed to the development of concepts of liberty in colonial America. I say careful historians. I name a number of them in the essay. Now, you wouldn't know that by listening to uh, the media these days. And uh, when you listen to people from the, um, I don't know, the Hollywood, the left uh, side of our culture, left-wing ideology, uh, you would think that it is the Bible believers who are destroying America. That, that is what they would lead you to believe. If we don't know how to defend ourselves with these ideals, certainly no one else is going to do it. And so it's, it's left up to us. But there are careful historians. No one reads them. The principle representing the Baptist application to the priesthood of the believer not only anticipated the First Amendment to the Constitution, but also led to the rudimentary assumption of the American way of life, the right of individuals to follow their conscience in all matters of faith, whether it is faith to believe or faith not to believe, whether it is faith to join your church or faith to believe um, the Jewish way or the Roman Catholic way. Um, it, following their biblically oriented conscience did not always endear Baptists to the state. Indeed, more often than not, an adversary relationship emerged. And this led to conclusions that encouraged citizens to think that separation of the state from the affairs of the church was, see that word, seditious. And uh, sedition is... Um, the process which leads to treason. You are uh, anti-government. And then the next ac accusation is that you are an anarchist. Um, well, separation becomes sedition. But Baptists, far from being libertarian or anarchical, uh, made phenomenal strides toward the pronouncement of a new, that is a different from medieval approach to civil authority. They made a significant contribution to the philosophy of government. Whoa! <laughs> now, that's a mouthful. And uh, I, I have to tell you that when I was asked way back in the early 70s to teach a course in the rudiments of America's Christian history and government, it really got me going. And I decided, as a result of it, to do a, a doctoral program in church history whereby I could study the Christian's relationship to civil government in every segment of church history. And so I did. And um, so... What we're going to talk about in this essay, I'm going to pick it up. I, I'm using the word Baptist, but I could use a lot of other words. I could, I could say uh, the free church through the ages contribution to America. I could say the trail of blood contribution to uh, the founding of America. I could say the gathered church concept contribution to America. Now, I know I'm using a lot of words and you don't understand maybe some of them, but I, I, I want to keep going. Uh, it, what we're dealing with here, class, is something, I don't know, that you, let me throw two words at you, it's called intellectual history. Uh, I, this is an essay in intellectual history. That is, I, I want to look at the flow of an idea, or ideas. And uh, ideas are intellectual, they're in the mind. And so I want to take a look at an idea or ideas and then see in whose person those ideas grab hold and then what do those persons do, what events, what books, what, what do they do? Now, 
Baptist history, sometimes we think of it as people, places, and events. Well, that's all well and good, and uh, we've got to know that. But I am always, this is just me, uh, because I enjoy the idea of philosophy, even though I am always mindful of Colossians 2.8, beware, lest uh, you are spoiled through philosophy and the rudiments of this world. But at any rate, it is ideas that get into the mind, and as the mind thinks, so a man acts. Now, uh, I'm going to pick it up with the Continental Anabaptists. Uh, notice that in the first paragraph, however, I'm going backward, I, I said the word, um, the phrase, priesthood of the believer. Do you see that? Kind of comes from 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also are an holy priesthood. That's, that's the New Testament. It's one of the Baptist distinctives. And it, 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 it is a biblical principle. It is a Christian way of life, whether it's Baptist or not. And so uh, I, I want you to see, if you can, how it is that that led to the First Amendment. Now, that, <laughs> that's a long stretch. And so it takes a lot of historical studies, uh, which I enjoy doing but the Continental Anabaptist. You haven't, have any of you read a book on the Anabaptist? You ought to write down somewhere uh, a man by the name of Estep, E-S-T-E-P, the Anabaptist story. It's great. By the way, anytime you pick up a book with the word story in the title, it means it is a man on the street approach to the subject. That is, it's not a scholarly tome. It isn't uh, something that will bog you down. Uh, so the Anabaptist story, it's a great um, long essay of what happened during the time of the Reformation. And, but uh, so, the contributions of political theory. Okay, <laughs> political theory. So I just jump from one concept to the next. When you are dealing with some of these ideas that become in their application to civil society, it becomes a political theory or um, a political view. And so it occurred without intention with the Anabaptists in Europe, and they began to think their way from New Testament principles to the tyrannous laws of the medieval monarchs. The short-lived Anabaptists in the 1520s, the subject of government was approached from the standpoint of the doctrine of church, ecclesiology, which logically followed from their particular view of man, anthropology. So yeah, you start thinking from your doctrine to your practice of the church, to your practice of the Christian life. And each believer was a priest who stood directly accountable to God for the actions of his own life, with no mediator between God and himself save the man Christ Jesus. Such individuality demanded a government of oneself. Obedience to strict commandments of right and wrong paid homage to the higher law, that is, the laws of God. A government by law, yes. Yes, but more than that, a government not of coercive force, but of voluntary submission. Freedom! The Baptist called it soul liberty. Liberty was obviously not license. It was liberty under law, God's law, especially the constructs of the New Testament. Not popes, not prelates, not church councils. Uh, these views did not set well with either the religious potentate who presumed to decree what others should follow or the civil magistrate who arrogated to himself a messianic complex. The independence of Baptist thought and character was an affront to the demands of servitude by the... <laughs> I got carried away with my words here, with the hierarchical humanoids of the medieval machinery. Ooh, those are good words, Del Johnson. Um, even they are little high-level abstracted words. 
But yes, and, and you can, you can, it, it, it is just phenomenal. To, we here in America, we, you know, here I am complaining about how wretched America is in 2016. Well, Del Johnson, how would you have liked to live in 1523 <laughs> where there was no constitutional rights that protected you, no Ten Amendments to the Constitution, no freedom of religion? How would you like to have lived then? And you were reading your New Testament and you had to decide, are you going to follow what the New Testament says? and put your life in peril along with your wife and children if you happen to be married or will you just go along to carry along because after all what can one person do um, well following such christian individualism by the way i don't like the word individualism i used it here in 1982 i used the adjective christian ism it's always a problem with me. I like individuality. I like individualization. Individualism can, uh, if you don't use the word Christian or biblical, it right away goes to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and humanism, and I want no part of that. But it is no small wonder that when the Anabaptists expressed their views of the church, as he did so in terms of local, that is, not universal, autonomous, that is independent, self-governing, assembly of believers who gathered themselves together for instruction in truth, that is not opinion. Get that? Get that? Once again, confrontation occurred. The gathered church concept, which assumed the God-given right of each individual to associate with whom he chose, ran smack into the path of that steamroller of conscience, the geographical church of the reformers. Luther, Calvin, and the Church of Rome mandated the masses of the people born within a geophysical area to belong automatically to the church of their no choice. <laughs> uh, and that is the case. Now, now so I'm going to stop, but i got to be careful here how often I stop. Uh, the New Testament uh, ecclesiology will have you to believe that Coming into a church is a voluntary matter. You choose to belong to the church. Someone else doesn't choose for you. And so, uh, you know, maybe here's a part of society and you choose to gather into the church. You choose to gather into the church. You choose to come into the church. You choose to come into the church. You choose to come into the church. And you folks gather together as a body of believers, but the whole society does not. The whole room does not, because it's a voluntary matter. And those of you uh, who came into the church chose to do it with liberty of conscience, with no coercion. It's called the gathered church because you gathered together out of society. Society and the church were not coterminous. <laughs> you, you get it? it? It was the geography... But, but that wasn't the case with Martin Luther, John Calvin, the Roman Catholics. You plant a church right in the highest part of a geographical area, build a church, make a big tower, and then all the people in the geography around the church um, automatically belong to that church. Automatically, if you lived in the geography, you are a member of the church. No choice. That's called the geographical church. And by the way, there's an ecclesiastical word for it. It's called parish. P-A-R-I-S-H. Baptists don't use the word parish. Baptist churches don't have a parish. Parish is a geographical term of the geographical church that coerce people. Um, 
And I said, <laughs> you know, so what happened is, if you were in the parish of the church and you chose to gather together to belong to an alternative church, you would perish, P-E-R-I-S-H. Um, okay, so Romanus, uh, and reformers alike exploited the non-New Testament practice of, there it is, the boogeyman, infant baptism, as the instrument to effect the result of a choiceless society. The independent gathered out of society church propagated itself by the instrument of proclamation. If you're going to proclaim something, You've got to have a skill of rhetoric, logic, ah, methods of persuasion. You persuade people to come into the church rather than persecute them into the church. What a big difference! And do you already see where that is headed? If society, uh, the institutions of society are based on persuasion, then you can choose for yourself. You can choose for yourself. You can choose for yourself. And we all disagree. We may all disagree, but we all live in society together. And we don't kill each other because of it. This is freedom and liberty. Where is this going to end up? I'll tell you where it's going to end up. In America, of all places, thanks to the pilgrims uh, and, the pilgr and the Puritans. Well, and so the gospel message of the Anabaptists in the valleys of the snow-capped Alps required of its recipients a decision of a vote. That's supposed to be vote. I don't know if it's spelled correctly there. Hence, initiating the idea of liberty. Liberty not for the elite few, but for all, including the common man. I like who wrote that great symphony, oh, uh, The Common Man. Uh, who wrote the symphony? Huh? Copeland. Copeland. Aaron Copeland. What's the name of the symphony? Fanfare what? Man. Fanfare to the Common Man. I love that. Well, at any rate, in the application of their doctrine to the church, Anabaptists unconsciously pioneered ideas of political liberty. Yeah, it's unconscious because they didn't set out to have a, a political party. <laughs> you know, they didn't initiate a political party to change the government in Austria or the government in Switzerland. But the liberty that was labored or advocated by the American Constitution, their ideas mitigated against the unified, monolithic, medieval society and encouraged the development of a composite society which has option built into it. Composite. Where you have in integrity units all together in a whole. This, is, this unit, this unit, this unit, this unit, this unit, all belonging to a bigger unit, so you have a composite. And so, with the idea that, you, that, that society can be made up of believers and a non-believer, and a Jew, and a Roman Catholic, and a Bible believer, and a non-believer, and a who cares, I don't care anything person, and a, you know, a businessman who only wants to get rich, you see, okay, so a composite society which has option built into it. Options? Yeah, Rufus Jones, in essence, said that Anabaptism was the spiritual soil out of which came the first announcement in modern Christian society, which the modern world, especially in America, has realized an absolutely free and independent religious society in a state in which every man counts as a man and has his share in shaping both church and state. Verdwine concluded that for the above stated reasons, America, the land of the free, is the fruitage of the vision for which the Anabaptist agonized, and that the house of freedom has been reared in those areas where men have made serious work of the New Testament vision as to societal compositivism. Thank you. 
you got to read for Dwayne's The Reformers and Their Stepchildren. What a great book. Changed me. Changed me forever reading his book. <laughs> and for Dwayne, it was a Calvinist. Writing, showing the value of the Anabaptist movement, but boy, did he do a great job. Roland Bainton, Yale historian, uh, aptly pointed out that the Anabaptist contribution to history in the era was in the area of three principles, which he said on the North American continent are among those truths which we hold to be self evident. What's that? A voluntary church, separation of church and state, and religious liberty. These principles were rooted in the soil of New Testament Christian individuality separation and property of conscience oh boy what a mouthful there well thank you Roland Bainton thank you Rufus Jones thank you Leonard Verdwine this isn't Del Johnson you know bleeding Baptist because you know he loves Baptist uh, specifically an Anabaptist named Balthazar Hubmeyer he is my hero, Balthazar Hugmeyer. He's the best of the best. I have the complete writings of Balthazar Hugmeyer in my library. I, I, well, and I have the complete writings of, of Menno Simons as well, even though I disagree with him a lot. But I, whenever I meet a Mennonite, I ask him, do you have the complete writings of Menno Simons in your library? And the Mennonites always say, no. And I say, well, then you're a fake. Uh, <laughs> I, and then I laugh quickly. Uh, but they're pacifists, so they won't kill me. <laughs> you can treat them badly and get away with it. Um, but they laid down seven principles which apply to the Christian relationship with the political situation. First, he said the right of the individual citizens to due process of law. Second, the primacy of obedience to government. Third, regardless of the decisions of government, there's an overriding providence of God in the affairs of men. Oh, do I love that? Do I love that? Do I love that? It's called the providential view of history. I am not a conspiratorialist. I don't even read conspiratorialists. I want nothing to do with them. That is not God's, that is not the biblical view of history. Fourth, that are there conspiracies? Yes. Are there, is there a satanic conspiracy? Yes. But fourth, that the believer must remember, especially amidst adverse political circumstances, that divine truth is immortal. <laughs> there it is, there it is. Truth is immortal. Truth is immortal. Wahrheit und Tutluck. I don't, I don't know my German. So you Germans, please forgive me. But Wahrheit und Tutlich, truth is immortal, truth is immortal. Um, I love it. So civil authorities have, the, he signed every one of his books. At the very end, his last phrase was, truth is immortal. Great. Fifth, civil authorities have the obligation to exercise physical force through capital punishment. Ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah, ooh, 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 ooh. All the other Anabaptists were pacifists. And you as a Bible believer could not be a policeman. You as a Bible believer could not join the military. You as a Bible believer couldn't be an officer of government. They were pacifists. Balthazar Hugmeyer was the one Anabaptist who got it right. Well, if you ask my humble opinion. Um, six, the judicial system is to be based upon impartiality and principles of God's word. And seventh, the state is to function as a servant of God. <laughs> Love it. It is not an end unto itself. It's not omnipotent. Harold Bender, a great Anabaptist historian Mennonite, states that uh, Hugh Meyer's book concerning heretics and those who burned them. I proudly wear, wear the label heretic, by the way. And at one time when I lectured on these things a lot, somebody made me a button and said, I'm a heretic. <laughs> and I wore it. Um, uh, is the earliest plea that has come down to us for complete toleration. Hugh Meyer's political views deserve more attention, but not in this essay. Whew. So much to study and so little time to do it. So we move from the Continental Anabaptists to English Baptists. And um, 
By the way, uh, in Baptist history, there are, there's a controversy as to how to interpret Baptist history. Do you, do you teach a particular view of Baptist history? The kinship, spiritual kinship. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. great. I, I'm akin to your kinship. <laughs> um, so I believe in a trail of blood. I don't believe it is lockstep. I don't think, I, I've, I've researched it a fair amount, and I've, I've written papers on the, on the Bogle Mills and the Cathari and the Al Albigensians and the Bohemian Brethren and on all these good folks and their view of civil government, by the way. <laughs> um, but um, why did I bring that up? Oh, because when I go from the continent to the English, we get into a fight, Baptist, too, over where did American Baptists come from? And I, you know, I, I don't want to get into any institutional uh, fighting on this, but so I'm just going to jump and not attempt a philosophy of Baptist history here. The fundamental principle which governed the continental Anabaptist movement, that is, of the immediate and direct accountability of God of each individual, was applied by the English Baptists in the way that they determined all their views, whether they were religious, social, or political. Okay, there's my subject sentence. So, what's the fundamental principle? That is, the fundamental principle is the individual's direct accountability to God with no mediator. What is that called in the Baptist distinctives? The priesthood of the believer. We are priests. We go directly to God. This is not coming from Roman Catholicism. It doesn't come from the Reformers and their view, their hierarchical views of, of ecclesiology where they have uh, not two church offices, pastor and deacons, but they end up with three church officers, uh, one that they insert in there for their hierarchy and call them bishops or whatever they wish. But so now what we're going to do is just see what did, what happened to this idea in England. Well, religiously, the Baptist insisted then on the right of individual to interpret scripture for himself. Oh boy, oh boy. Uh, and when they added, without interference from the state, the principle suddenly took on political overtones. And further, when John Smythe, I say Smythe, do you say Smythe or do you say Smith? Smith. Okay, I say Smythe. It, just because that reminds me to put the letter Y instead of I. Uh, but it's just a, uh, one of my idiocies. Uh, it disallowed, he, John Smythe disallowed the infant baptism of the Church of England. Whoa! The iron fist of statism came crashing down upon him. And Smythe replied with a plea for religious liberty. Hence, to Smythe belongs the imperishable honor of being the first Englishmen to plead for full liberty of conscience. Smythe was the first to claim full religious liberty ever penned in the English language. According to Lyon's book, The Theory of Religious Liberty in England, Smith's article on faith stated it this way, we believe that the magistrate is not by virtue of his office to meddle with religion or matters of conscience, to force or to compel men to this or that form of religion or doctrine. Smythe's idea of liberty were expressed just short of, look at that, 200 years prior to the same expressions in the First Amendment of the American Constitution. And who wrote it? A Baptist! And why not a Lutheran? Why not a Presbyterian? Why not a Roman Catholic? Because they didn't believe in the priesthood of the believer. Well, some of them did in various forms. Well, in addition to the foresight of Smythe was the articulation of Thomas Helwes. I say Helwes. In 1612, hmm, one year after 1611, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Published the first demand made in England for universal religious liberty, for freedom of conscience for everybody. A 200 page book expressed his Baptist conviction that the king had no authority in, but in earthly causes. And for men's religion to God his, is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Neither may the king be judge between God and man. And guess who did not like that? His name was King James. <laughs> and who will find their way to America because of his persecutions? The Pilgrim 16, what? 20. Okay. Um, one historian said, he always gave to religious toleration the finest and fullest defense which was ever received in England. For these views, now uniformly accepted as a part of the great American way, Helwes lost his life, and he made the ultimate sacrifice for a principle which was initiated by and continued through the teaching, preaching, writings of the Baptists. Thank you, Thomas Helwes. Baptists helped write the book on the American way. You want to talk about the American way? I'll tell you what faith in Jesus Christ has to do with it. Uh, thus, as co-authors of the self-evident truths, quote into quote, they are presented, they are presently surprised to hear some in the name of the American way condemn Christians for their political expressions. The modern attack on Christian civic concern is a denial of an irrefutable American Christian history. It is a brazen attempt to blow apart the Judeo-Christian consensus that produced the culture of the American way. And we must not allow this ignorant attempt to go on challenge. Baptists have nothing to hang their heads in shames about. To the contrary, we have a reason to take pride in the intellectual history of our faith. What happened between 1982 and 2016? My, my mind is just a roar of stuff. The English General Baptists, I like this because I'm not a Calvinist, were guided, the General Baptists were not Calvinists, uh, were guided by their doctrine, reasoning from their doctrinal view that no man is predestined by a divine decree to damnation. These biblicists came to the, the, became the first to plead for complete freedom of conscience for all. Why? They drew the inference. There is a key word. you got to know the word inference. That to destroy a man for his mistaken beliefs might defeat the purpose of God for that man's future salvation. They mused that while he lived, he might yet be saved from the error of his ways, especially the truth presented it to him in spiritual forms, and no coercion was applied to his conscience. So a concern for soul winning led to the twin political truths of religious liberty and freedom of conscience. We want to lead him to the Lord. Don't tell him. He said, he slams the door and said, get out of here and don't you come back. We don't take out our gun and shoot through the door and shoot him. It's not, we're not Muslims, Allah or death. It's not that. It's not the Roman Catholic uh, Inquisition. You become a Roman Catholic or we will kill you. No, these truths were not first espoused by Romanists or Reformers, but by Bible believers who are unafraid of making civil application from their theological positions. Ho, ho, ho. Isn't that good? Aren't you glad you came to class today so you could hear, hear something? It is to be greatly lamented for the last 100 years plus. Baptists have lost the ability and or the willingness to reason from biblical principle to a correct view of civil government. Recent court cases ought to serve as vivid reminders that eternal vigilance is the price of religious freedom. And when we go lethargic and apathetic to our lessons of our own history, we run the risk of losing all that we have gained. And oh my, 
And now that the Supreme Court has mandated, so to speak, homosexual marriage, I don't call it gay marriage, I don't call it same-sex marriage, I call it homosexual marriage, because that's what it is in older terms. Now we're going to, in public education, right on down, I was reading this week, down to five-year-olds start coercing children to change their God-given sexuality. Oh, now you're meddling with who we are as God created us physically, emotionally as well. But how am I doing? How much time do I have left? Uh, about uh, 13, 14 minutes. Boy, you class, you need to start listening faster. <laughs> you are slow listeners. Well, so now we come to America. Roger Williams, one of my unusual heroes. <laughs> Early Baptists of America were translated Englishmen. They journeyed from Anglican to Puritanism, from Puritanism to Separatism, from Separatism. To, they kept getting gooder and gooder. And they became goodest of all uh, when they failed their grammar. Uh, they were men who inherited the rich, free church thinking of John Wycliffe, a man who had declared in 1384 that the Bible was for the government of the people, by the people, for the people, of the people. <laughs> by the way, shame on me, I'm going on a secondary source. If any of you ever find the exact book of Wycliffe and the page where I, I, wanna, I need the primary source for that. Uh, thus, the congregational principles, I love congregational form of church government, uh, principles of self-government were passed along individually and then ecclesiologically. Uh, these principles are recognized in the lives of two men, Roger Williams, Isaac Backus. Now, and so in your library, you've got the complete writings of Roger Williams. Hoya moya. I dare you to try reading it. I have many times. And, uh, and then the history of the Baptists by Isaac Backus in New England. Shame on me, I've never devoured this either. Um, but um, uh, so Roger Williams, although a Baptist for less than one year, some people, you know, can do a lot of good in less than one year. <laughs> Uh, from the time Williams arrived in America until his death, a continuous battle raged between he and the Puritans. Initially, Williams revealed two principles of government. First, coming from a strong position on the right of private property, Williams argued that regardless of what the king's patent said, the Puritans ought to pay the Indians for any land they took from them. Boy, now you want a subject to pursue all the way through American history what our American government did to Native Americans and the concept of land and property. Very interesting. Williams believed firmly in the internal property of conscience and thus external property was also respected. Second, William refused to take an oath of freedom uh, for he viewed the oath as an act of worship. I can't discuss that with you. I'd have to study it more. Williams, to Williams, the state was to be totally separate from religious functions of the church. William came to this conclusion by reasoning that since Rome was Antichrist, <laughs> to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor, you have to sign a document to, even to this day that you believe the Pope is Antichrist. So uh, some of these uh, Reformation uh, views uh, still exist. Any system which combined that, but his view was that any system which combined the state with a religion, as did Catholicism, was imbibing the spirit of Antichrist and hence to be shunned. And thus he wanted no part of the Antichrist system founded by the Puritans in the Bay Colony, which could, by use of the sword, force hypocrisy upon his conscience. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Separating the state from the church was the only way to ensure that the church remained pure and true to the New Testament. After these disagreements, Williams confirmed the Puritan suspicion of Anabaptism by being 
immersed after his banishment from the Bay Colony. His rejection of infant baptism was a way of totally separating himself from the church state unison brought about by the sprinkling of babies. The fight with the Puritans took Williams to England where amazingly, amazingly, I never studied this, I never wrote a paper on it, it would be a great one how in God's good providence he published several works advertising and explaining and popularizing his principles and he was successful and returned to America with a charter, a political charter for the state of Rhode Island. Good for him. The only American colony that allowed for freedom of religion and Roger Williams allowed Jews to come in Oh boy, the reformers, and in Germany, they did not like the Jews. They called them Christ uh, killers. Uh, but Williams believed in religious freedom. Well, a key to understanding Williams was to comprehend his view of eschatology. He thought that the system of Antichrist arose with Constantine and then continued in the papacy, which manifested itself in any mixing of civil and religious authority, whether Protestant or Catholic. Old England as well as new, it was Roger Williams against the world. Amazingly, the world lost, said Paul Wright in his book. Even Winthrop, the great Puritan, Williams' lifelong antagonist friend. Isn't that great? They could be antagonist and yet friend. He wrote, and a baptistry increased and spread in America, which occasioned the magistrates to draw order for banishing after due conviction. Well, because Williams argued against the state's right to punish violators of the first table, that is the first commandments, he was viewed as what? Seditious. Anarchist. Was he? No. Did he have a dim view of government? Yes. So one overriding governmental principle that William espoused was that of freedom of conscience. Now William's definition differed from many of the Puritans. To Williams, the conscience stood apart from any jurisdiction of the state or the church. In other words, the conscience of the individual was at liberty, whereas Puritans believed the conscience was free only to be subject to the policies of the, I should have put the word Christian in there, Christian government. If one did not obey the Christian government, then he was sinning against his own conscience, and hence he had to be punished by the, the Christian government. To Williams, there was a higher law than the civil government to which his conscience conscience was ultimately accountable. And this made Williams courageous and fearless in his dealings with the Puritans. And once again, Baptist ideals became a part of the American system, a free church in a free state due to the personification of Baptist uh, ideals in the life of Roger Williams. It is no surprise that taking these Christian principles and theological starting points, Williams established the Rhode, in Rhode Island a form of civil government held by the free and voluntary consent of all. I love Rhode Island and Brown University, but now they're all apostate. Baptists in America, you have, then you have Isaac Backus. Now how many minutes? Ten? Five. From Roger Williams to Isaac Backus, there was a steady stream of men in and outside of the Baptist circles who held ideals expressed in the paragraphs above. Principles of a gathered church encouraged a self-governing, grassroots leadership, and the various revivals inspired a spirited individuality requiring people to make their own choices to which they were held accountable and responsible, and thus the arising Christian uh, Christianity of the 13 colonies, developing an independence of thought, activism, voluntarism, was laying the foundations which found expression in the American Revolution, says the great Kenneth Scott Latourette. you got to read him. The clergy were preaching that rights came from God, not government, and that government begins with the individual and proceeds with self-government. The logical conclusion of the principles of the free church, back Baptist, made for democracy. Latterette states that the basic principles of salvation by faith, 
which is say a personal choice, priesthood of the believer, accountability directly to God with no intermediaries, held by the gathered churches of independence, Baptists, Quakers, etc., issued forth in governments in which each citizen had a voice and possessed rights and responsibility equal with those of his fellow men. Voila! And you come to America. I'm going to choose to gather with believers. I'm not going to choose to gather with the believers. I'm going to choose to be nothing. I'm going to choose to be an atheist. I'm going to choose to be a Jew. But you're all equal. You all have a voice. You're all and there's more to this. Walt Bacchus, a Baptist preacher during the Revolution era, picked up the cudgels of Hugh Meyer and Williams and led the fight for religious liberty. Primarily, he fought against the imposed religious taxes by the Massachusetts, read, Puritan authorities. The point he drove home to the revolutionary leaders was that liberty of conscience, the most important article of liberty, was not allowed even by men who complained about the encroachments upon their own liberties by the British Parliament. He said the root of all these difficulties is the assumption by civil rulers of a power to govern ecclesiastical affairs. Bacchus fought to make religious liberty a general principle, a natural right, not a denominational privilege. So we might start to de-emphasize the word Baptist when we are in civil society. Bacchus defended himself by use of scripture, the theory of natural rights, and by appeals to the great John Locke. By the way, ooh, 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 read John Locke, but not what the scholars say about him. They all make him out to be a, a, a deist. You read what he wrote about the scriptures, it's unbelievable, who said conscience was much a natural right as life, liberty, and property. It was one of the basic rights of mankind. Bacchus leaned on Samuel Adams to speak out in behalf of civil liberty. Whoa! A preacher went to political leaders and had conversation. John Adams responded to one four-hour Baptist plea with these words, Gentlemen, if you mean to try to effect a change in the Massachusetts law respecting religion, you might as well attempt the change of the course of the sun in the heavens. <laughs> Baptist and the indomitable Baptist, by the way, Oh, McLaughlin wrote a, a two-volume history of the Baptists in America, and it's entitled The Indomitable Baptist. He gave unrelenting pursuit to the change of the sun's path, which was accomplished in 1833. Oh, there it is. Uh, thus ending a 200-year battle. Well, Isaac Bacchus lost no time in endorsing the American Revolution, believing in the right of the people to establish their own government. He wrote, the great end of government being for the good of the governed, not the honor and profit of any particular person or families. The community has an inalienable right to reform, alter, or newly form their constitution of government. As with the community, to judge to be the most conclusive, blah, blah, blah. Well, Bacchus preached to the troops in Boston. He said, I fully, can fully believe in our cause is just. He viewed the revolution primarily as a providential act to clear the way for the overthrow of repressive established system. Biblically, Isaac reasoned from 1 Chronicles 12.32 that passive obedience to the king brought a nation to the brink of popery and slavery and that England had violated her own laws of government by binding the rights of the colonists and that the Constitution of England guaranteed that an individual's property could not be taken from them without their consent, but yet they billeted soldiers in their home. That was a big gripe. Besides this, the First Continental Congress now provided a higher authority than the Massachusetts legislature to which they could appeal. Thus, a group of Baptists was one of the first to recognize the authority of the Congress, going before them pleading the case for religious, that religious taxes were contrary to the principles of the great Mr. Locke and a violation of the biblical injunction 
that religion was a concern between God and the soul, which no human can meddle. So the Baptist memorial to the Continental Congress was this. No one whose bosom feels the patriot glow in behalf of civil liberty can remain torpid to the more ennobling flame of religious liberty. Well, so the Baptists applauded Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence because it was self-government. Next paragraph, a biography of the Tories. You can hardly find a Baptist in it. Ba next paragraph, Baptists realizing that the principles for which their forefathers lived and died were a part of the wave of the future, supported the Declaration of Independence, the Continental Congress, the Revolutionary War, and in the end, the Constitution as well. And it was the Baptist preacher, John Leland, living in uh, Virginia, who persuaded James Madison that if Madison would promise and to add an amendment to the Constitution, assuring religion liberty, then he, Leland, would drop out of the race, throw the Baptist support to him, and, and, and Madison agreed. And it was Baptist uh, and Manning in Massachusetts that aided the very close vote that favored the ratification of the Constitution. <laughs> Yay for the Baptist! Yay for people who cared not for their own life but who were, that their life was just run by an idea that came right out of the scripture of the priesthood of the believer. And so Madison became a, a chief leader, and then it came about. Congress shall make no law establishing articles of faith or modes of religion or abridge the right of people peaceably to um, assemble. And thus ended 1,000 years of religious persecution for the baptistically minded free church movement. The medieval concept of coercive society was overturned and the individual was was given liberty at last. Baptist involvement in the revolutionary cause brought great dividends from which we still collect today. These Baptist men of God brought through the ages paid a tremendous price for the eventual victory of immortal truth. Truth is immortal. Wahrheit und Tutlich. The question arises. Are you students willing to pay the same price to keep the liberty? Am I? Only we can answer the question. Our answers had to fight the establishment. We, had the privilege, we have the privilege of using it. Our good friends out west are not using it. I'm talking about the farmers in Oregon. That, the ranchers. The privilege must become a responsibility. The life of the Christian school movement depends upon our response. What will yours be? I love what R.V. Clearwater said, and of all places, his little book called The Local Church in the New Testament. Of course, R.V. Clearwater's, I went to the seminary that he founded. He's my, one of my patron saints. If I can put it that way, that's not very Baptistic. But he said in, in his book on ecclesiology, of all things, that Wycliffe's principle that the Bible is for a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, is a fundamental truth upon which hangs the economic principle of free enterprise, the political principle of representative government, and the religious principles of personal liberty and freedom. If believers do not rise and fight off the enemies of the scripture, who will, armed with truth and courage, let's march forth to battle, which means we go to chapel. God in heaven, help us to do just that. Amen.